The Cincinnati Bengals beat the Las Vegas Raiders 41-24 to in what had become a must-win game for the team. There was a lot of good, there was some bad, and we're going to talk about it all up next here on No Buts About It. What's up, everyone? It is Josh here from No Buts About It, and today we're going to be talking about the Bengals game against the Raiders and what we liked. What very good game for the Bengals offensively. Uh, defense stepped up as well. There's a lot of good, but there was some bad, and we shouldn't just let them off the hook yet, in my opinion. And I'm going to talk about that why here in a little bit, but first we're going to talk about the good, talk about some overall uh, narratives that came out of this game. And I wanted to put this out ahead of the full show because I want to talk about the Ravens a little bit more during the full show, but there's a lot to talk about with the Raiders as well. So I'm just going to separate them out. Uh, we didn't get to the full show last week because of Halloween and just schedules and chaos, but we hope to get to one this week. But without further ado, let's talk about the Bengals. So first of all, coming into this game, it was scary. I mean, that that's not something we thought we were going to be saying when the schedule came out. But the Las Vegas Raiders, even though they were two two win team, uh, they've got some playmakers on that team, right? And the Bengals have struggled somewhat randomly throughout the season. So when it came out that Orlando Brown Jr., T. Higgins, Zach Moss, and then kind of at the last minute, Jermaine Burton would all be out, that was very concerning for me. I was like, oh my gosh, we are going to march Joe Burrow into uh, a game against Max Crosby with Cody Ford and Amarius Mims, who's been great, but I mean, we're talking about Max Crosby here as the primary tackles. Well, you know what? Credit to Cody Ford and um, Amarius Mims. So Amarius Mims, first of all, he just lo he looked great. Um, he, Of course, he there were some snaps where... Max Crosby got around him, but I think I saw in true pass pro sets, he allowed zero rushes. He allowed zero hits. Uh, Joe Burrow did, only got sacked once the entire game, and it wasn't even Max Crosby who did it. So that's huge. And then um, I've been hard on Cody Ford, but Cody Ford looked pretty decent as well. There were a few snaps where he ended up on his back. But again, we're talking about a very good pass rush for the Las Vegas Raiders. And I, I personally thought Joe was going to spend a lot more time on his back than what he did. Um, so to limit that entire team to just one sack, to limit Max Crosby to no sacks, that is absolutely huge. Um, this dude is an absolute beast and is highly respected by NFL players all around. We kind of saw that when he kind of, <laughs> it was almost a funny play just because no one got hurt on it, but he, uh, he jumped the snap, and I don't think anyone knew what was happening because he was unabated to the quarterback, got to Joe, hit Joe, and kind of realized as he was hitting him that he messed up, got penalized, and Joe even went over and uh, said, hey, you know, no hard feelings. So I appreciated that good situation right there between those two. Um, the other major narrative that I want to talk about is Chris Jenkins and McKinley Jackson looked great. They looked great yesterday. B.J. Hill went down early uh, in the game, and McKinley Jackson and uh, Chris Jenkins had to come in to help out. And Chris Jenkins, he he, he even came away with a sack. Um, kind of gave me a semblance of what we'd been hoping for from these two. Uh, there was a joke that you know Chris Jenkins or excuse me, McKinley Jackson. This is Chris Jenkins here. Chris Jenkins got that sack, but there was a joke that McKinley Jackson is the Bengals' favorite third-round pick because, of course, Jermaine Burton was also taken in the third round, and we will talk about why he was out or speculate why he was out here in a few minutes. But Chris Jenkins and McKinley Jackson were able to uh, put some pressure on that interior offensive line, push them back into the quarterback, and that allowed Trey Hendrickson, who had a phenomenal game, to uh, clean up. That's what we kind of saw with DJ Reader. DJ Reader would occasionally get a sack, 
but what he really did was uh, put pressure on that O-line and push them back and allowed Trey Hendrickson or Sam Hubbard to come in and get that sack. So if we can get back to having that on the interior defensive line, that is going to be huge, especially going into Thursday Night Football against the Baltimore Ravens. I also wanted to give some brief credit to Lou Anarumo. Uh, early on, I had questions about why DJ Ivy was man on man with Brock Bowers, and it was not going well. Brock Bowers looked like he was going to have a great day, but then he uh, he adjusted. Lou Anarumo found a way to get Jordan Battle in, and Jordan Battle ended up actually having one more snap than Von Bell this week. So, uh, Maybe we'll hopefully we'll see more of Jordan Battle against the Ravens, but I I liked what we saw. Brock Bowers got really quiet after Jordan Battle got put on him. Um, Jordan Battle had a great pass breakup uh, on Brock Bowers where he just kind of ripped the ball out of his hands. That's what we've expected from Jordan Battle, and that's what I hope to see more of from him. So those are just some quick storylines, some quick narratives to talk about from that game, and uh, hopefully we see more from those guys as we go uh just some things to look out for but the main narratives are what i want to get to now first so joe burrow had a phenomenal game joe burrow went 27 of 39 for 251 yards 115.5 passer rating five touchdowns one interception that one interception was a pick six which you know i don't even know if there was People wanted to blame Zach Taylor on that because it looked like a screen call. And I think that the, the the play didn't even really have time to like form. It was we went so quick. I don't know if Jamar Chase was the only read on that play because Joe just kind of without even looking, just turned and shot it. And Jack Jones, he just jumped the route, got the pick six. I mean, I, I say credit to Jack Jones. He's done that before uh, to other teams. So we know that he knows how to read those plays. Maybe he just recognized it from film. I don't know. I, I don't want to say Joe Burrow. It wasn't completely his fault. Maybe he couldn't, maybe he could have uh, done something else. He could have kept the ball and ran or who knows, but overall that was just, it was just a great play by Jack Jones. I think is what it needs to come up to. Maybe Yoshi could have blocked or something, but um, <laughs> I really, I was, it happened and I was like, I'm not even mad. Like, we're up enough that I, I hope that that's not the win because Jack Jones, that was just a great play. But Burrow was not satisfied. And there were there was that play, and then there was another play where he had a dime to Jamar Chase, and it just disconnected, didn't get completed. Um, so he he wasn't happy. He, he was tweeted out, I think Paul Daner Jr. tweeted it out, that Joe Burrow is the least happy Five touchdown quarterback in NFL history. Because I mean, he threw a touchdown to Mike Gusecki, and he just looked angry. Like, if you saw his face, you would have thought the Bengals were down by, like, 30 points, but they were up uh, by a ton. So he was very upset with uh, the imperfections, and he, he gave a great quote in his press conference that I wanted to read here. He said, I'm not going to ignore the bad. I'm going to be hard on myself. I'm going to be hard on us. And I like that. I like that, that that leadership mentality because Joe is not a get up on the bench and yell and scream type of leader. He's he's very much seems to be, obviously I'm not in that locker room, but he seems to be a leader of few words, but he leads by his actions. And I think he wants to show the team like, yes, you can celebrate this win, but we are not out of the doghouse yet. We've still got to keep winning. We have a huge game coming up on Thursday. And by him kind of just keeping that demeanor, keeping that head down mentality, um, even after having a great game, that is a great signal to the rest of this team. Moving on to another guy who had a phenomenal game and uh, he needed to with Zach Moss being out. It's Chase Brown in his second year. Now, of course, uh, we talked about how we wanted Chase Brown to get more carries. We're like, why is Chase Brown not getting more carries? Near the end of last season, he looked great. Well, he got an opportunity here, and he showed why, or he showed that he deserves more carries. 
Uh, he ended up getting 120 yards on a career high 27 carries. He also had five receptions on five targets for 37 yards and a touchdown. So great day for Chase Brown. There was like a whole drive where the whole thing the, it was either the first or the second drive. The whole thing was just Chase Brown. They go down and score. It was a great, great way to step up for the young running back, especially considering that uh, they were without T. Higgins, they're without Charlie Jones, without Jermaine Burton, um, and Jamar Chase was pretty much locked up. I mean, through all this, Jamar Chase really didn't do anything yesterday just because the Raiders were focused on him. And, of course, there were some Raiders injuries as well in that secondary and on the offensive line that may have, you could argue, contributed to some of these stats. But ultimately, uh, Chase Brown just stepped up, had a great day, and uh, hopefully they can carry that into uh, Baltimore because at least with Baltimore, they do have a better defensive line and their pass defense is where they struggle. However, I um, I think if we can get a respectable run game going, just it doesn't have to be phenomenal, just something that the defense has to like at least pay attention to, that will open up. Uh, Jamar Chase that will open up potentially T Higgins if we have him back uh, Jermaine Burton as well if he's able to go uh, we'll see what happens there another guy step, uh, these guys are stepping up like crazy these were the guys that we needed to step up and they did so uh, Mike Gusecki Mike Gusecki got his first and second touchdowns as a bangle he also uh, got 100 yards so Eric all goes down around the second or third quarter ACL injury. He might be out for the season. I don't know if it's a full blown tear or what, what that situation is, but we had drew sample step up. He had a touchdown. Drew sample had a huge fourth and three, uh, or excuse me. No Tanner Hudson had the huge fourth and three grab drew sample had the touchdown, but needless to say, all of the tight ends stepped up. Eric all got some grabs in as well before he got injured. But Mike Gusecki was the highlight of the week. So Gusecki got those 100 yards, and it's his first since 2021 against Jacksonville when he played for the Dolphins. And this is only the third career 100-yard game for him. It was also the third time in Bengals history that a tight end had 100-plus receiving yards and multiple touchdowns. The last Bengals tight end to do this was my boy, Tyler Eifert, who happened to be the ruler of the jungle yesterday. So Mike Gusecki saw Tyler Eifert there, got inspired, and he stepped up. And we need him to carry that momentum into next week because really, uh, or into Thursday, because really Mike Gusecki is a wide receiver. He We use him as a wide receiver. He's been used most of his career as a wide receiver. So when T. Higgins goes down, or we have these games where we have multiple starting wide receivers out, Mike Gusecki being able to step up and play like that is huge. That allows for the passing game to open up in a new way. Eric all goes down. They go into spread offense. Um, I, I, liked, I liked what we saw. And I hope I really hope that this game, yes, it was a two-win team, but it could be a momentum builder that is needed to go up against the Baltimore Ravens. And the Baltimore Ravens, we've already played them once this year, and it turned into a shootout. And we should have won that game, but we had some poor coaching decisions. We had some little issues. And that's what Joe Burrow's talking about. He's saying, like, yeah, we won this game, but we we've lost to, we've lost because of other little things, and we made little mistakes during this game against the Raiders that we can't afford to do against other teams. So uh, but Mike Kosecki stepping up, uh, continue that, carry that into the game Thursday, and that will be huge, um, especially if T. Higgins can't go, can't go again. Trey Hendrickson, the most underrated pass rusher. I don't know how this man did this, but he is still not being discussed. Trey Hendrickson. He let, let's pull up a photo of this man. I don't know why I don't have one loaded, but Trey Hendrickson is an absolute beast. He had a four sack game against the Las Vegas Raiders. That's right. This man right here, number 91, extend him now. Mike Brown, Duke Tobin. This guy is underrated. 
He had a four sack game, and I haven't even seen anyone talking about it outside of the Bengals. Uh, he is now the sing. He is now the sack leader in the NFL. Uh, his four sacks were second most in any NFL game this season. And were the most by a Bengals player since Antoine Odom had five on September twentieth, two thousand nine, against Green Bay. So this was a historic game for the franchise as well. And these sacks consisted of he dropped Gardner Minshew, uh, forced minus seven yards, forced the three and 19. Second sack, he dropped Desmond Ritter uh, into four and 15 in the fourth quarter. Then he dropped Ritter again on third and long. And then his fourth sack was a strip sack and with a fumble recovered by Logan Wilson. And Logan Wilson was another guy who had a phenomenal game. Um, I just don't think that we can ignore Trey. And Trey Hendrickson, he got locked up last week, to be frank. And he he needed a rebound game, and he found it. He got locked up by Fred Johnson on the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and he had no help. I, he hasn't had help all season. We're going to hopefully get some during the trade deadline. I'll talk about some guys who I think could maybe do that. But Trey Hendrickson had a phenomenal, phenomenal day. He uh, definitely earned that extension. I know fans want him extended. The Bengals have to do something. They have to make a trade. They have to extend someone. They have to do something to show the fans they care. If you go and look on the Reddit or the Twitter or the social media pages, Bengals fans are still not happy. A lot of them are asking for refunds for their season tickets. Yesterday was their first win at home in week nine. Trey, it was a great win. It felt good, but it also didn't feel like this team is where they need to be. If they can go into Baltimore and win, maybe things will turn around. Uh, Logan Wilson staying on the defensive side of the ball. He, like I just said, he got that fumble recovery. He also had another fumble recovery um, just a little bit later. That was huge. He is the first Bengal to have two fumble recoveries in a game since B.J. Hill in week three of the 2022 season against the New York Jets. So Logan Wilson, another stud. Bengals have extended him. Um, he has been great for this team as well. But that was the good. That was all, and that took a lot of time to go through. And that's good that it took a lot of time to go through. It means there was a lot of good. But Something we need to discuss, something we need to talk about is Jermaine Burton and this guy right here. Now, Jermaine Burton, he's a guy that I I liked talent-wise. I thought he was super athletic. Uh, he was drafted right around where I thought he would be. But my concern with him was his attitude. It was what kind of player is he going to be in the NFL? I didn't know if Zach Taylor, if a coach like Zach Taylor would be able to kind of mold him. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. And Joe Burrow, coming into this week, it sounded like he was going to be a huge part of this game. It sounded like they knew T was going to be out. Jermaine Burton was going to get his chance. And then Saturday, some things went down where I don't know if he, he, slept in and missed the Saturday practice or what happened, but he missed Saturday's practice. And Zach said in his presser, like, Hey, we just had to do what we had to do. And we had to sit him out this game. And I actually appreciate that from Zach Taylor. Some fans might be like, Oh, well, you're, you're wasting uh potential to make a point. But I think this really shows that Zach Taylor is serious about developing this young man. And he is doing even though Burton may not like it in this moment, he is doing what Burton needs uh, to show that he is serious and that the NFL is serious. Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor both said that they believe that Jermaine Burton is got a great future ahead of him. They said he is a great worker. They said he is practicing well. He's great to be around. He's a great asset to the team. He just screwed up essentially. So hopefully they can put that all behind them. Hopefully, Jermaine learns from this, and the Cincinnati Bengals will be able to use him for years to come. And this is a part of his development as well. Just getting him serious, getting him to getting him to know like it's not all fun and games. There's some work here to be put in if you're going to be a Cincinnati Bengal. 
because this team wants wins. This team wants victories. And it sounds like Joe is going to hold him and the rest of the team to that account accountability. So maybe we'll see him Thursday night. We'll see what happens. Just been, He's just been a really weird storyline to follow all season. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to talk about was you're not escaping, Zachary. You are not escaping my my criticism. Yes, they won. Yes, your play calling was better. But your clock management was awful. Oh my gosh, I was losing my mind talking about th- watching the clock management. We went into the fourth quarter without any timeouts. We had one timeout left about midway through the third quarter. And Zach challenged a punt. He challenged whether it hit the one yard line or was a touchback. Everyone who was watching the game on TV, I don't know what it looked like in the stadium, but everyone who saw the replay that was on the Jumbotron, who everyone who saw it on TV, knew that it was a touchback. But also, even if you weren't sure, why would you make that challenge when you have one timeout? Because then you lose not only that timeout, you lose that challenge. And actually, there was a play Jordan Battle made earlier or later on that could have been challenged because it looked like it was a fumble, but we didn't have any challenges left. We didn't have any timeouts left. What are we doing? And I, I know. I know we won. I know we won. It's great. But let's let's flip. the. Let's say somehow the Raiders start to come back. Let's say that pick six just reignites the team. They start to come back and they manage to score and get ahead. And the Bengals just don't, they don't even have one timeout to work with. That's, that's the type of little thing that has lost the Bengals games. That's the type of thing that lost games to the Ravens, to the chiefs, to the Patriots. These are those little things that Joe Burrow is talking about that need to be worked on. And that time management issue has been been such a huge one. There was another situation where they were on, I think it was like second and goal, or they were with they were in the red zone, and the Bengals made a late substitution. Which, you know, you might be thinking, okay, they're trying to trick the team. Problem is, when you make a late substitution, the defense gets a chance to match it, and the defense doesn't have to rush onto the field there. I mean, it's not their fault. You decided to make a late substitution Raiders fan, Raiders players just kind of jogged onto the field real slow delay a game sets the team back again in this game. Didn't really make much of a difference against the Ravens. It will against the Ravens. That can be the play that loses the game. So there's just things like that. It's just so annoying to see a year. What six head coach doing this. Like these, these are basic things. These are things you should understand uh, by year two, if not midway through year one. Like, come on. And I, I appreciated the play calling. I appreciated getting the run going more. I appreciated spreading the ball around. I thought that was great. Just the clock management was awful. That is a problem that needs to be worked on. Um Overall, though, the players looked great. The players did well. They seemed to be uh, ready to go for this game. Uh, get them ready for Thursday night football against the Ravens. And if they can come out, if the defense can come out playing as balanced as they were with the offense, this will be a competitive game again against the Ravens. And if we do those little things right, then this will be a win for the Bengals that the Bengals badly need. But if this team wants to be taken seriously, the Cincinnati Bengals have to do something like I alluded to, whether it be a extension. I really think the Bengals need to be available at the trade uh, deadline. So the trade deadline is tomorrow, Tuesday. So, the only team that has really been active so far has been the Arizona Cardinals, who traded a sixth round pick for linebacker Baron Browning um, from the Denver, Denver Broncos. So there's still some good guys out there, and there are some guys that I like for the Bengals. So, my first one that I really like for the Bengals is 
Aziz Ojolari. Now, we saw Aziz Ojolari when the Bengals played the Giants, and he had a great game. He has six sacks on the season. Uh, he will be a free agent next year, so I wouldn't necessarily give a ton up for him, but I think he's very attainable. I think that um, he could add to that pass rush. He's also a, I believe he's an outside linebacker, so he would probably be more of a replacement for a Asai, and that would allow Murphy to still get some snaps as well. Yes, he's an outside linebacker, so that would allow to keep that rotation with Murphy and Hubbard going, keep continuing to get Murphy snaps, um, who has shown flashes. Asai, I'm kind of... He's shown flashes as well, but I'm kind of out on him. Just bring in Aziz Ojolari. Um, the the Giants, frankly, can't afford to extend him, so they, they're going to lose him anyway, so they probably will want to trade him. They've got Kayvon Thibodeau's fifth-year uh, option coming up. They've already paid Brian Burns a ton of money, and they also have um, one Dexter Lawrence, who they extended. Who that That's a ton of money to have in the pass rush to just – for a team that's going to be rebuilding, uh, they're probably going to want those draft picks more. Get Aziz Ojolari and get Sam, or get well, yeah, Sam Hubbard, Miles Murphy, but most importantly, get Trey Hendrickson some help. However, if you don't want to uh, go to Aziz Ojolari or if he's too expensive, another guy who might be available is Chase Young. Now, Chase Young is with the New Orleans Saints right now. Hasn't been um, as phenomenal as what people thought he was going to be when he was drafted. Um, he was a 2020 pick right there with Joe Burrow. I remember there being discussions that the Bengals should draft Chase Young instead of Joe Burrow. Now, those obviously sound like insane talks right now, but they I do remember them happening. Um, he has two sacks this season. And the New Orleans Saints have already fired Dennis Allen. They fired him earlier today. So they, they are probably in rebuild mode. They are also in uh, cap space hell. Uh, the, he, Chase Young is another guy who will be a free agent next season. So this wouldn't exactly help their cap space. But they will want draft picks because they're probably going to lose a ton of players trying to recover from cap space hell. I just think Chase Young could be a fun one. He's not he's not my favorite. He's not Aziz Ojolari. Aziz Ojolari would probably be my favorite of the realistic guys for the Bengals to grab. But Chase Young could be helpful as well, defensive end. Get him in there as a rotational piece um, with Miles Murphy, uh, Sam Hubbard. I don't know how that would go. That's also kind of why I like Aziz Ojolari more because I know Sam Hubbard hasn't been great, but he's also – at least a high end backup at this point and having chase adding chase young to that rotation, I think just would add more confusion. Um, because then you'd have chase young, miles Murphy, Cedric Johnson, maybe even, uh, just in, in a confusing rotation. I just think Aziz Ojolari is a, is a much better pick, but some, I figured some Ohio state fans might be happy, uh, for me to throw up chase young as a pot. He's as a potential grab. We'll see. I, like I said, maybe just a depth piece, but we'll see what happens. Finally, another Saint who he would be huge. He's been struggling with injury, but he has allowed just a uh, passer rating under 70 when he's played. He's he's had some injury issues this season, though. But Marshawn Lattimore, oh my gosh, this would be a huge grab for the Bengals. He is not a free agent until 2027 either. Cornerback is a position of need for the Bengals. They've got some guys who are more promising, but I'm not super I'm not super confident in the cornerback room right now, if I'm being honest. Like like I like DJ Turner. He seems like a great guy, but he just he's so inconsistent. I I called it I said he's kind of like Eli, he reminds me of Eli Apple when he was with the Bengals. And that's like almost a compliment because I, I wasn't a huge hater of Eli Apple, at least as much as some other people are. But DJ Turner, some weeks, he's just really good. A lockdown guy, no problems. And then the next week, he's like lost. Same thing with Cam Taylor Britt, who last season, in the uh, beginning of this season, 
looked like he was going to be a top corner in the NFL, and now he's just kind of fallen off. He got he got completely spun around um, by some of his uh, receivers he was covering yesterday. So uh, Jacoby Myers, I think, made him do a complete circle. So uh, the corners definitely need some help, and Marshawn Lattimore would be a stud for the Bengals to bring in and would definitely reignite this uh, defense, I think. It would allow for the Bengals to also uh, just be more versatile on that defense, move things around more. Uh, Dax Hill's out for the season. Just You got Mike Hilton. He's going to be a free agent next year. Another guy who you could extend possibly. Just I, 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 I just want the Bengals to do something. I think Marshawn Lattimore uh, is a realistic target as well that they could add. Um, they've already got Saints players on the team that he's played with like Trey Hendrickson and Von Bell. And we just got news from Ian Rappaport, not a trade, but the NFL has flexed Colts jets out of Sunday night football, and it is being replaced with chargers Bengals. So there's a little, uh, end of video news for you. The Cincinnati Bengals and Joe Burrow will be taking on Justin Herbert and the Los Angeles chargers in week 11. So that's all I got for you today. Like I said, we will talk about the Ravens more in the upcoming show or later this week, but I appreciate y'all for stopping by. Please make sure to like and subscribe. It helps us out immensely and it's completely free for you. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments. Do you have worries still? going into this game against the Baltimore Ravens, or are you completely confident about what this team did against the Ravens and you or the Raiders and you think they are good to go? But until next time, go do something nice for someone.